Welcome to the Do Nothing Pod, everyone. I'm grateful that you've tuned in today. Today, I've got a really amazing guest, Dr. Andrew Weil. He is a leader in the field of integrated medicine, integrated health. He's a doctor with a degree from Harvard. He's traveled the world, studied health and wellness for many, many years. At the age of 77, he is a picture of health, lots of energy, which you could pick up in his voice and his excitement for all the things that he's doing. He's also an entrepreneur, to say the least. Uh, he's written many best-selling books. He is uh, a partners in a chain of restaurants which promotes healthy food called True Food Kitchens, which I highly recommend. I've been to many of them in my travels. Uh, there's 30, I think, all in total now, and they continue to grow. He also is a big proponent of matcha tea, which has taken on uh, quite the interest these days. And he has uh, the website matcha.com of all things. He was able to secure that your URL and sells a high quality matcha tea product, which I highly recommend. And he provides us with a discount code actually at the end, which is pretty cool. So to say the least, this was a fascinating discussion. I learned a ton. I know you will as well. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Weil. So in these times, being so certain, causing a lot of anxiety and stress, you know, what are the some of what are some of the things that you're doing personally to sort of, you know, uh, keep yourself in a in a healthy, integrative, an integrative way, of being healthy. I'm really limiting my intake of news, especially television news, and I really recommend it to everyone. I think that uh, you have to be very careful how much of that you let into your life. It's, it can be a great source of anxiety, stress, and anger. You know, it doesn't mean don't be informed, but just really pay attention to the effect of that on your mood. Um, I, I try to really attend to my eating habits. Uh, you know, right now, many people are eating more than they would like to and eating foods they probably normally wouldn't eat just for comfort or stress relief. I think you want to be careful about that. I keep up all of my routines. I swim every day. I walk with my dogs. Uh, probably been reading more. I practice my uh, breath work for uh, relaxation and stress relief. Um, I, I am very delighted when friends send me funny things, either funny YouTube videos or, or movies to watch that make me laugh. I think that's essential right now. Um, I try to get out and spend some time in nature as I can. Uh, so those are you know, some of the things that I do. Could you ever have imagined that something like this would sort of take over our world? And you know, I'm afraid I could because uh, I had been reading a lot over the past few years about pandemics and new diseases. Um, and I'll, I'll just tell you a story. I grew up in Philadelphia. I was born in 1942. And my father's mother lived with us for off and on when I was growing up. Uh, she had also been born in Philadelphia. And uh, she told me stories of the 1918 flu pandemic. Philadelphia was the hardest hit city. Mm. By the way, for, for the reason that it did not follow uh, sensible public health precautions. Uh, at any rate, she told me stories of, of horse-drawn carts of corpses going through the streets of Philadelphia. That made a very strong image, <laughs> impression on my young mind. And I tried to get information on it when I was in junior high school, high school. There was none out there. I think this was such a heavy event that it was culturally repressed until relatively recently. Uh, but, you know, that pandemic makes this one look pretty tame. And uh, many, many experts have been telling us that we are due for something like this and something worse. And uh, one of the things that, that I think is important to know is that these, uh, they're called zoonotic diseases these, that spill over from animals to humans. They're becoming more frequent and worse and entirely because of our activities. It's, there are too many people, too many people living in too dense populations. It's a result of deforestation, climate change, the way we interact with animals, our eating habits, our agricultural habits, all of this is increasing the probability that we're gonna see more, more things of this sort. So I hope this is a wake up call for us. You know, we were horribly unprepared for this, even though we had plenty of warning. 
And, uh, you know, I, I hope we really get our act together. So if something even worse comes around, we will be in better shape to deal with it. Hmm. Yes, I hope you're right. Okay, so let's turn it over to the team and to our guests. Uh, if there's any questions, just go ahead and wave your hand. For those of you that know me, I could get on a roll and the next thing you know, it would be all, it would be, uh, you know, the whole time would be up. So uh, who would like to start? Just wave your hand, please. Uh, Grace, yes, please. All right, well, thank you so much for being with us today. Sure. I'm all super excited. So I just wanted to get your opinion. Do you think um, we're, from your sense of everything, and do you feel like we're kind of towards the peak, um, or do you think we're still leading up to that? It's so hard to say. It looks as if that, you know, that we're flattening the curve in many parts of the country now. But I think a lot of people expect a second wave at some point, maybe in the fall, maybe a third wave. Um, I think it's clear that as we relax restrictions on, on social distancing, that there will be an increase in cases and an increase in deaths. And I think a question we have to look at is, you know, there's such pressure to open the economy and we have to balance that against the public health considerations. And I don't know how that will play out. I, I think we're, we're, you know, I think in some parts of the country, we probably have passed the peak, but that doesn't mean that we can relax. As an entrepreneur yourself, you know, both in your mind balancing the health and wellness of the society and also the business side of things, I'm curious where you start to land when you're thinking about it. I guess somewhere in the middle, but I, don't, I really don't know <laughs> what to say. I mean, I, I just can't imagine the hardship that so many people in the country are experiencing right now. Yeah. Um, you know, who have lost work, who have to pay rents. Um, it's just, you know, overwhelming. So I think something has to happen there to make that easier for people. Um, and I, I guess we have to accept, uh, you know, some of the health consequences of, of trying to move toward reopening the economy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who else would like to ask a question? Yes, Emmy. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Weil. This, Hi. Is my, this is a real treat. I'm, uh, I'm excited that you're here and I have definitely uh, had your books and followed your career and uh, it's just a, a real treat to have you in our presence. Yes. So thank you. And I, was, I just want to flip back to the evolution of integrative medicine a little bit and for you to comment on why has it why does it continue to be the underdog why has it not become more mainstream well it is becoming now you know this is certainly what consumers want but i i think it's really uh uh first of all let me say it's made great inroads there's there's a um an organization called the uh, Consortium of Academic Health Centers for Integrative Medicine that now includes almost two thirds of the nation's medical schools. Um, there is uh, this, the term integrative medicine is totally accepted in academic discourse. There are textbooks of integrative medicine. Uh, our center has graduated almost uh, 2000 practitioners from our very intensive training. So I think it really is becoming a mainstream phenomenon. But what will, what will propel it forward is economics right now because the, the current uh, medical system is just unsustainable economically. Uh, we pay way too much and our health outcomes are very poor. And I, and I think the fact that integrative medicine can save money and produce equal or better outcomes is really getting the attention uh, of healthcare institutions. And that's why this has opened up so much. So I think time is on our side here. Thanks, Emmy. Did you have a follow-up? I'm sorry. Well, the follow-up would be, how are you seeing it filter into medical school training? Is it becoming a bigger part of the curriculum? Definitely. Uh, for instance, at the University of Arizona, we have what's called a distinction track in integrative medicine for students. And I think, uh, I think something like 20% of the incoming class has uh, registered for that. So uh, there are you know, courses in integrative medicine in medical school. Our center has a uh, curriculum that's in residency training that's now in 81 residency programs across the country. Uh, so it's getting in there. 
Thank you. And by the way, let me just say, if you go to uh, our center's website, which is integrativemedicine.arizona.edu, there's a find a practitioner link and you can look for one of our graduates in your area. Um, and we've got graduates in all states and in all specialties. Great tip. C can you talk a little bit about the benefits that you've found with matcha tea? Yes, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of matcha green tea. This is the powdered tea that's used in the Japanese tea ceremony. Uh, I first met it when I was 17 years old and went to Japan and fell in love with it. And I drink it regularly. This is my, I have having iced matcha this morning. <laughs> Unsweetened, but it's uh, uh, the color is brilliant green. Uh, it's full of antioxidants. It's got, uh, you know, a very high antioxidant content compared to other forms of tea. Um, it agrees with me. It is a, you know, it, it has caffeine in it, but the effect is very different from that of coffee. Um, be, probably because there's another compound in it called L-theanine, which is a relaxant, uh, has calming effect and modifies the effect of caffeine. So it's not jangling, it produces a state of alert relaxation or focused, uh, you know, focused awareness. And uh, I, I told you before we came on that there's been some uh, research papers just in the past year showing that the compounds called catechins in, in uh, matcha green tea inhibit the entry of the uh, COVID-19 virus into cells. So that's not claiming that it's gonna you know, prevent you from getting it, but it's certainly something that you can add to your regimen and has some beneficial effect. Something that you shared with me about uh, coffee uh, the last time we spoke was that you had seen patients over the years that uh, maybe had a couple of cups of coffee in the morning and they, just in general, they were speaking about how they had trouble sleeping at, uh, yeah. throughout their life and never correlated that even though they had that caffeine earlier in the morning, that that was actually still causing them sleep issues. There's a, a very broad spectrum of sensitivity to caffeine. Uh, there are people who drink one cup of coffee in the morning and can't sleep at night because of that. There are other people who can drink a pot of coffee at night and have no effect. So you want to find out where you are on that, on that spectrum. When I was actively seeing patients, I used to say I produced one miracle cure a week just by getting someone to stop drinking coffee. And that was everything from uh, recurrent urinary tract infections to irregular heartbeats to uh, GI problems to insomnia to anxiety. It's a strong, coffee is a strong drug. And many people who use it are addicted to it and have a withdrawal syndrome if they stop. You don't see that with, uh, with tea and certainly not with, uh, you know, matcha green tea. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. And it's fun. One of the nice things that um, kind of the process of making it yeah, uh, with the whisk is, is yeah. very meditative and right. calming just in itself. Um, so I've really enjoyed it. Okay, any other questions um, that somebody might have? Yes, Rachel. Hey, Dr. Lyle, thanks Hi. so much for coming on. Um, I also fell in love with matcha while traveling in Japan and just love it to death. Um, I was just wondering if there's other um, kind of less mainstream or le like other foods or products from other places that maybe Americans haven't discovered that you also think. Can oh, I'm them. constantly looking for those. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I try to introduce a number of them to uh, and get them here. One uh, that I uh, found in Asia, it's used in Japan, but especially in more tropical areas, is bitter melon. Uh, and this is a vegetable uh, that's used in Indian curries and in stir fries. Um, and in Okinawa, they make it, they just juice this and drink a little jigger of this. It's quite bitter, uh, but if you mix it with other things, it's, uh, it's palatable. And it has a very uh, good effect on blood sugar. Um, and also good antioxidant activity. So that's, a, that's, you can get it in Asian stores and uh, most people are unaware of it. Thanks, Rachel. Um, any other questions? What about breathing? Oh, I'm sorry, Grace, go ahead, I missed you. Oh, no worries. I just had a question to see if you had any recommendations or insights on supplements. I do. Uh, first of all, you know, you can, all of this information is in on my website, drweil.com, and also in my uh, books and uh, my 
probably the book that would give this best to you is called Healthy Aging. And it's a whole chapter on, on supplements. Uh, I, I think it's a good idea to take a, a multi, uh, you know, a multi uh, nutrient supplement that includes vitamins and, and minerals in the right amounts. Um, I recommend taking supplemental vitamin D. Uh, and this is one, by the way, that has great preventive effect against viral infections and, and uh, COVID-19. Um, I uh, am a big fan of uh, mushrooms as medicines. Uh, especially Asian mushrooms, and there are various products. You, there's some of these you can get as food mushrooms, like shiitake and uh, oyster mushrooms and maitake. But you can also get supplements that are made of extracts of these mushrooms. Uh, and some of these um, mixed mushroom extracts have very good effect of, of increasing, boosting your immune defenses, um, lowering your chance of getting infections of all sorts, especially viral infections, as well as increasing defenses against cancer. Um, so th those are some of the things that I recommend. Also, probably a good idea for most people to take uh, supplemental fish oil, especially if you're not eating enough oily fish because uh, many of us are deficient in omega-3 fatty acids and the best source of those is oily fish like salmon and sardines and mackerel. Uh, but you know, for many of us taking a supplemental fish oil might be a good idea. You, do you still have sardines during your days? I do. Uh, you know, I'll tell you another one I like, a relative, is kippers. Uh, and, and you can get these at any supermarket. They're cheap. Uh, they're, it's smoked herring fillets. And uh, like sardines, these are low on the food chain. So they're not likely to have any heavy metal contamination or other things you're worried about. They're sustainable fish at the moment, available in great quantities. A great source of omega-3 fatty acids. Now, I know many people wrinkle up their noses at the thought of sardines. Uh, but the way I like, I like to uh, mash them up, uh, mix them with some mustard, lemon juice, and chopped onion, and either eat them on crackers or a lettuce leaf. And I find that a very easy, quick, uh, you know, mm -hmm. lunch or snack, and it's a great source of omega-3 fatty acids. Are there other fishes that you uh, recommend or think we should stay away from? Well, certainly ones to stay away from. Uh, you know, you want to stay from away from large carnivorous fish. You know, they're the ones that are most likely to be contaminated. So that's things like swordfish and uh, king mackerel, marlin. Um, I think, uh, you know, there's a, um, the um, Monterey Aquarium has a good website and wallet card uh, that lists fish. And there's another one put out by, I think it's the, it might be the Audubon Society, but they list fish, uh, recommend them both in terms of sustainability and toxicity. Uh, so it's just good to take a look at that when you go shopping to see which ones stay away from. There are other ones like things like orange roughy that are, it's an endangered species now. You shouldn't, we shouldn't be eating those. Um, a lot of people are concerned about tuna and uh, mercury. Uh, wild caught, uh, you know, line caught albacore tuna from the Pacific Northwest is a good form of tuna uh, that's relatively clean. I think uh, things like ahi um, probably want to eat in, in moderation. And, um, you know, some of these, the bluefin tuna, there's so few of those left, although they're beginning now to farm them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think farmed fish probably is the future, uh, but it's important that that's done <laughs> in a reliable way. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Michelle. Hi. Come off mute. Sorry about that. Thanks for being here, Dr. Weil. It's sure. a pleasure to meet you. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about iodine deficiencies. I've been reading mm -hmm. a lot about that lately and I'm a little confused about you know, it used to be in the, in the early part of the 20th century, there was what was called a goiter belt in, in uh, America, which was everything in the middle of the country uh, where <laughs> thyroid enlargement, thyroid tumors were common as a result of iodine deficiency. People on the coast were eating uh, iodine sources in fish and shellfish, and in the middle of the country that wasn't there. Then we started adding iodine to salt, and iodized salt became widely available, and that largely ended that problem. But in recent years, uh, many, many people have been switching to sea salt, which is not iodized. So many people are not getting that, that uh, source of it. 
Uh, women seem more prone to iodine deficiency than men. Um, and it's probably a good idea to find out to get your iodine level tested uh, and see whether you need to take supplemental iodine. So, so if you're a woman, if you've had any thyroid issues, uh, it's a good idea to get that checked, and especially if you're not using iodized salt and not eating much seafood. Thank you. How do you feel about oils in general? In using oh, I have a lot of feelings about oils. First of all, you know, fat does not make us fat. That was, a, you know, that idea I think has been totally discredited now, and there's much more focus on carbohydrates as, especially quick digesting carbohydrates as being the things that really drive cholesterol up and and promote weight gain. Uh, but I think there's a, there are many differences in oils. You know, some are healthy, some are not. Uh, you want to eat oils that have a high percentage of monounsaturated fat. Uh, for me, olive oil, good quality olive oil is my basic go-to oil for cooking, and there's no problem with heating it to high temperatures, as some people think. Um, you know, the Olive oil, the quality of it varies all over the map, and there's been a lot written about adulterated olive oil and not good. Um, I've, the Trader Joe's has some really good uh, olive oil that's uh, inexpensive. Uh, one tip about olive oil is that um, good olive oil has a, something in it that causes a burning sensation <clears throat> or peppery taste at the back of your throat you want that. That's a compound called oleocanthal, which is a unique anti-inflammatory compound in olive oil. So that's something to look for when you use olive oil. If you don't want the taste of olive oil uh, when you're cooking something, uh, I recommend using uh, avocado oil, which is now it used to be too expensive, but now it's become relatively inexpensive. It has a very high smoke point, very good fatty acid profile neutral taste. And another oil that I like very much is algae oil, which many people are, are not familiar with. This is a relatively new product. There's a brand called Thrive. You can get it on Amazon. Also neutral taste, even higher smoke point than, um, than uh, avocado oil. It's got uh, uh, one of the omega-3 fatty acids in it as well, DHA, and it's a neutral taste very good and also a, a low, a small environmental footprint uh, in producing this stuff much better than growing oilseed crops. So olive oil, avocado oil, uh, algae oil, great. I use uh, some oils for flavoring like walnut oil uh, in salads, but you don't want to heat them or, or toasted sesame oil, you know, in Asian dishes are great. Um, I would stay away from uh, most of the, you know, the commercially produced um, oils that you see in supermarkets, safflower, sunflower, corn, uh, their fatty acid content is not great for us. Mm -hmm. And you want to stay for anything that's partially hydrogenated. Great. Okay. Alex. Uh, you talked about uh, caffeine sensitivity in the beginning. Uh, is there a particular test that you'd recommend? Yeah, you stop drinking it and see what happens. <laughs> you know, if you, if you, if uh, it is, a, it's amazing to see what happens to people who are using coffee if they stop, uh, you know, typically 24 to 36 hours later, you get a pounding headache. Uh, you can become fatigued. I've seen people incapacitated by this, it relieved instantly if you take anything with caffeine in it. Um, and it usually lasts 48 hours and then you're through it. But it's good to know if you are physically addicted to it and then you can decide what you want to do about it. Can you use matcha as a, as a uh, yes. sort of moving Absolutely. away from it? Yeah. <laughs> yes, definitely. And uh, I, I, that's something that I often recommend. There's also a, uh, a form of tea called pu'er that's less well known in this country. It's a dark, uh, it's a Chinese tea. It's uh, aged uh, and fermented. It's very dark, so it makes a brew that looks like coffee and has a sort of dark, earthy taste. So that's something else that uh, it's got a relatively low caffeine content, but that's something else that people might find useful. Mm, that's great. Another question? Tracy. Here we go. Um, well, this is a big change in topic, but yeah. in terms of like mental health, um, mm -hmm. for those of us with school age children, 
who went from being extremely social and yeah. active to yeah. nothing. <laughs> yeah, I can't um, imagine. How do you, how could we best support them or what is kind of your outlook for what we're gonna need to establish normality for them again? Ooh, tough question. I don't know that I'm an expert on that. I think, first of all, imagine the plight of uh, many kids in this country who don't have access to computers, uh, which is probably even worse. So I think uh, making, getting as many kids connected as possible would be very helpful. Uh, I think virtual learning can be terrific. Um, and I, I'm just very impressed at how effective that can be. Um, in terms of, of social interactions, I, I, I think this will gradually open up. So uh, I don't know, I, I'm sorry, I don't really know what to tell you. I think I, it must be really tough to have kids at home who aren't able to. What, what strategies are you finding that help? I mean, I've seen things like, you know, established bedtimes and those kind mm -hmm. of things and everybody getting quality sleep. They're in my house just kind of blown out of the water. <laughs> so, um, you know, despite thinking it would be a great idea to stay on a schedule, it's just not one of the battles mm -hmm. that I'm going to fight right now. Um, so it's things like, um, you know, how, how will I get them back on that track? Um, again, school age children. So I just, I just think a lot um, and it keeps me up a lot at night about um, how to best support them through something that none of us have ever been through, whether it be, you know, good nutrition, supplements, sleep schedules. Right now it's still in my house kind of, um, we have a kind of a routine, but it's still not super structured. And do you talk with them about it? I mean, how they feel and, and what problems? Absolutely. Yeah, I would say. We're big talkers. <laughs> yeah, good, good, good. Yeah. What about, Bri oh, Grace, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to share one thing that I'm doing. I know my daughter's much younger, but um, I'm just trying to keep as much normal in her life as I can. She's not mm -hmm. seeing her daycare friends. So on the weekends, I schedule Zoom dates, and we literally mm -hmm. just go on Zoom, and we let the kids see each other. So I don't know if you're doing anything like that where they can see their friends or they may already be doing it, but it's been helpful for me. Mm -hmm. Dr. Wow, what about some of your, uh, the breathing techniques that you use? Well, there's one main one, the four, seven, eight breath. And yep. uh, you're familiar with that. And if you look on YouTube, just put four, seven, eight breath and my name, there's videos of me demonstrating it's very simple. That's something I recommend doing with kids, by the way, and the whole family can do together. Uh, that's the most the time efficient uh, method of, of stress neutralization that I know, and just very good uh, practice for general health. How does that work? You know, why is it when we stop and do that uh, breathing method that it helps reduce our stress level? Uh, breathing is the only function that you can do completely consciously or completely unconsciously. Uh, it's run by two different sets of nerves and muscles, uh, voluntary ones and involuntary ones. So the theory of breath work, and all this originated in ancient India thousands of years ago, is that by using your conscious system to impose certain rhythms on breath, gradually you induce those rhythms in the involuntary nervous system. Uh, and that's really the only way that you can get at and change the tone of the involuntary nervous system. Uh, so you actually can change heart rate, blood pressure, digestive function by working with the breath. And it's a practice. You have to do this regularly. It doesn't take any much time, but it's something you want to do regularly. And uh, that uh, breathing technique is by far the most effective anti-anxiety measure that I've ever discovered. It makes the drugs that we use for anxiety look pathetically weak. <laughs> How often do you do this each day? Uh, I recommend doing it at least twice a day. It takes all of about 30 seconds. Uh, you can do it more frequently if you want. Uh, but the important thing is to at least twice a day. I do it in the morning when I get up or in the evening when I get to bed. Mm -hmm. And then any other time during the day that I feel like doing it or feel anxious about something. Mm -hmm. As we, some of the states, as they start to open up um, and we start to venture out a little bit more, uh, is is wearing masks important? I know they're saying in places that you have. You know, to I think it's important to show other people that you're concerned about their welfare. You know, there, there's debate about whether it does you that much good, uh, but certainly it is reducing the 
<clears throat> the droplets that you put out into the air that may have infectious particles on them. So I think that's probably good practice. You know, um, one of the things that I noticed in my time in Japan over the years, and this goes way back when I was first going there, there was a cultural practice of people wore masks when they didn't feel well. Uh, and it was a way of really being concerned about other people's welfare. I, I've just been appalled in this country, in this long before this current problem, of people, seeing people who are obviously sick being out in public and even waiting on people and clerks. I, I, that's just not a good thing to do. You know, if you're sick, you should stay home. Why do you think we do that? I, I think it's just, un, it's unconsciousness probably. And also, I guess people feel that, you know, they have to go to work. It's more important for them to go to work than to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard you talk about micro shield throat spray. Yes. Is that useful? <laughs> yes, it is. This is a, uh, a product that's made by a friend of mine, Paul Stamets, and it's a, a mixed mushroom extract uh, that you spray into the throat. You spray it into your nose as well. Uh, I don't know that we have hard data on it, but it's something that I use when I travel, if I'm on airplanes, uh, if I feel myself beginning to get a sore throat. Um, it comes in various flavors. I like the cinnamon one. There's also a peppermint. And, uh, but I, I think it is a, a useful product. It's part of the, I, I'm just fascinated by all the research that we have on these uh, Asian medicinal mushrooms. And the, you know, they're completely non-toxic and they really seem to boost our body defenses. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? How? Yes, Josh. Yeah, I'm just curious, uh, Doctor, what your comfort level is and what you need to see in order to kind of re-engage out there in the community um, and kind of what you're, look, what you're looking for. Well, I, I think that uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to get out of my home and move about. <laughs> But I think I will continue to practice social distancing. Uh, you know, not 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 go into groups of more than ten people. Uh, not to get you know more than two feet in people unless I know they are. Um, I think that that would be for for now my comfort level until I see which way this thing is going. When did you first become interested in plant medicine, and you know, what, what is your take on where it is today? Uh, well, first of all, my interest in plants is something that goes way back. Uh, I, something I got from my mother and that she got from her mother. And that led me to be a botany major as an undergraduate at Harvard in the 1960s. Uh, that was an unusual choice of major then. Botany was an old fashioned field. Uh, but I had the good fortune to um, have as my mentor a professor named Dick Schultes, who was considered the father of modern ethnobotany. And he really got me interested in a career interest in medicinal plants. Um, and I, so I began studying from that time. And when I went to medical school, I was really shocked and disappointed to see that the people who taught me pharmacology had no knowledge of the plant sources of the drugs that they were teaching about. And the more that I became aware <clears throat> of plants and how they worked, I saw that they acted differently from chemicals taken out of them. Uh, and that I found that the plants to be often, well, certainly safer, but often better in their effect than isolated chemicals, uh, and certainly much safer. Um, so I, I, that's a, a field that I have an active interest in. And when I was seeing patients regularly, I estimated that for every prescription I wrote for a pharmaceutical drug, I probably gave out 40 recommendations for botanicals. And in the years that I did that, I never saw a single adverse reaction to any herbal preparation that I recommended to people. Um, so I, I, you know, this is one of the core curriculum subjects that we teach in integrative medicine. Um, I think it's a, a good idea to be familiar with, uh, you know, a handful of really important medicinal plants that you can keep in a home medicine chest, for example. Uh, valerian, which is a very safe sedative um, used for centuries in Europe, very good for, you know, if you need to fall asleep. Uh, kava, a very good anti-anxiety agent. Um, things like... Um, um, there's a peppermint for peppermint tea for uh, 
if you've eaten too much for stomach distress. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there's like a, a number of these things that are that it's really good to be familiar with that are inexpensive, safe, and that really work. By the way, one uh, we're coming out of it now, but there's a there's a very intense allergy set, a season here in uh, Arizona this spring, and there is an herbal remedy for hay fever that is so much better than any pharmaceutical product. It's nettles uh, and freeze dried nettle leaves and capsules. Uh, relieve symptoms like itchy eyes, sneezing, often within minutes of taking it. Um, you know, just a, a really wonderful remedy. So that's a good thing to know about. Mm -hmm. What about plant experiences that help, you know, I've read about that, that help us maybe get through some difficult times in our lives, like ingesting mushrooms or uh, things, uh, ayahuasca. Things well, you know, like there's that. tremendous interest in this right now. And, and, uh, when I was traveling last year, when I was going around uh, speaking, no matter what the subject I was talking about, whether it was nutrition or healthy aging, I would get questions about psychedelics and, uh, you know, it's on everybody's mind. And it's, uh, I think, fascinating to see this, uh, you know, rekindling of interest in this subject. Um, I, I, I think we are close to seeing uh, MDMA being made available for post-traumatic stress disorder for psilocybin to be made aware of, uh, for uh, drug-resistant depression, for example. Ayahuasca, possibly. I mean, there are many um, reports on this uh, having enormous beneficial effects on people. Uh, there's a uh, center now for research in this at Johns Hopkins University, and the man who directs that has been documenting uh, increased in spiritual awareness and people taking uh, these agents. <clears throat> By the way, if you want to watch something terrific, uh, search on YouTube for Housewife on LSD. Uh, I won't tell you any more about it. It's a video from the 19, I think it's from about 1960, uh, of a psychiatrist administering LSD to a very straight housewife. And I won't tell you any more about it, but you will give you a sense of the potential of these things. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, what do you think this shutdown for so many of us uh, where we've kind of not been able to, I've not kind of, we haven't been able to go out and do our normal things. And, you know, what do you think this does for us as a global society? You know, are we, are we more aware coming out of this? Well, you know, this is a, I think a unique event in that, you know, unlike say the 1918 flu pandemic, uh, we really are aware of this going on all over the world. And uh, in a way, I think this is uniting us as people uh, and that may have some very beneficial effects. I'm also curious to see uh, what will be, how much will be permanently changed by this. You know, I hear people saying that handshakes will not, will be a thing of the past. Um, in uh, before the 1918 flu pandemic, Spitting was an acceptable cultural practice. You know, saloons had spittoons in them and it was okay for men to spit. After that, it was no longer culturally acceptable. So, you know, maybe things like handshakes will no longer be culturally acceptable. I expect that more people will work from home afterwards. You know, I think we're really becoming familiar with using uh, Zoom, for example, and, and virtual teaching. Uh, and maybe we'll see more of that. And, mm -hmm. and maybe, you know, I in, last year I was, in the past few years when I've been traveling to give lectures, you know, I was saying, boy, I'd much prefer to stay home and do this, you know, <laughs> virtually than fly across the country. <laughs> so do you maybe, think, uh, do you think we'll see more virtual conferences and things of I that do. nature? I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's probably a good thing. I mean, it seems very inefficient to physically travel, you know, in order to, mm -hmm. to, to do this. And we have the technology now to do it. What about universities? I mean, you're, you're so closely associated with the University of Arizona. You know, how are these uh, university leaders looking at the sort of the model now? Yeah, I, I don't know, but I can tell you our center, uh, you know, we've always done a lot of uh, online uh, teaching. Uh, we have some residential time for people in Tucson, but we have found our, our online uh, courses are very, very good. You know, they're, they're very well designed, and uh, it's been interesting to see how virtual communities form of these classes. It, it works very well. So uh, maybe there will be a shift in that direction. Mm -hmm. Do you think we'll be able to hug each other again? 
<laughs> I, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Jeez. Yeah. Um, well, in our closing minute here or so, is there any last questions? Okay. Uh, Dr. Weil, if there's one or two things that we could do in terms of our, more, or our daily routines, um, what comes to mind to sort of keep us in a good mental and physical health uh, place so we can get through our days with some of the challenges that we're Well, I, I really can't recommend too highly the 478 breathing technique. I mean, it's so simple, so time efficient, great. So please look that up. It's, it's on my website on, on YouTube. Um, as I said, I would be very cautious about how much news, especially television news, you let into your life because it can make you crazy. Uh, and I think it's good to try to connect with nature in any way that you can. Um, you know, try to get regular physical activity, try to get good regular sleep. You know, those are the basics. All the basics that we yeah. just need to put a greater focus on, especially in these times when it's yes. uh, so uncertain. Thank you so much, Dr. Weil, for doing this. I know how busy you are and it means the world to us. Um, to have you come on and, you know, answer our questions and, you know, help us uh, see the world from a different point of view. So great. I enjoy talking with you all. Okay. You have a great day and thank you so much.